Welcome to But What About Me, a career success podcast dedicated to giving a voice to underrepresented populations or UPs and helping each navigate their career to reach their highest potential. This podcast is brought to you by JenniferTardy.com. Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of But What About Me? I am your host, Jennifer Tardy, and today's guest is the phenomenal Nika White. I heard her speak at the Diversity 2.0 conference earlier this year, and you know what? Her unique perspective on inclusion really knocked my socks off, and I knew, I just knew I had to have her on the show to share more on what it means to be an intentional inclusionist. In this episode, Nika talks about what is an intentional inclusionist, the importance of assuming positive intent in others, when to address unconscious bias, embracing tokenism, and she talks about how you can evaluate a company's level of inclusion. For those who didn't get to hear Nika speak at the Diversity 2.0 conference, don't worry because I'm providing a VIP backstage pass. So grab your notepads and get ready to take it all in. Let me tell you a little bit about Nika. So Dr. Nika White's professional career spans about 20 years, ranging from serving as a diversity and inclusion practitioner, an accomplished marketing communications executive, economic development leader, and community advocate. Dr. White found inspiration through the intersection of business diversity and leadership and has made that her niche. She is a national sought-after consultant, thought leader, and speaker to countless organizations and executives on issues of team engagement, organizational leadership, strategic diversity, and intentional inclusion. In 2017, Dr. White launched Nika White Consulting to focus on delivering subject matter expertise in the diversity and inclusion space to organizations throughout the country. She's the author of The Intentional Inclusionist, a book for leaders who desire to grow as inclusion-minded individuals and exercise their leadership to enhance the workplace, build communities, and have a positive impact on any circle of influence to which they belong. Dr. White is also the author of The Next Level Inclusionist, Transforming Yourself in Your Work for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which was released in September of 2018. You can learn more about Dr. Nika White at NikaWhite.com. Let's get into it. All right. Well, welcome, Nika, to the show. I appreciate you for being a part of our But What About Me podcast. How are you? I am doing very well, Jennifer. Thanks so much for thinking of me and having me on the show. Not a problem. I'm really excited to have you here. I, um, when we were thinking about what show topics we wanted to do, I went back to look at previous notes from presentations, and I remembered hearing you talk at the Diversity 4.0 conference about the intentional inclusionist. And I didn't even have to think about what questions I wanted to ask you because I could just look at my notes to see what areas I wanted to dive in more deeply. And so um, I kind of just want to jump right into these questions because I'm so excited about it. I love it. (laughs) So my first question to you, um, your platform is talking about the intentional inclusionist. What is that? So the intentional inclusionist is a phrase that I coined um, actually into 2017. And there's, there's two main premises of the book. The first is anything that we strive to do, whether it's in the space of diversity and inclusion or not, we have to make sure that we are exercising a great level of intentionality if we want to realize the end result that we are hoping for. And secondly, we have to also consider that being inclusion-minded is a leadership competency. Mm-hmm. It is a growth capability that all of us have. And I find that there are a lot of people, particularly leaders, individuals that have um, a keen level of influence in whatever circle they belong, they may appreciate that diversity and inclusion um, is happening and occurring, but they're passive about it because they see it as the responsibility of maybe someone that carries the title of diversity and inclusion officer, director, manager, et cetera, or they will see it as a responsibility of the HR professional. 
And so part of the message in this book and behind the notion of the intentional inclusionist is that if you are a leader, regardless of your title, your background, your experience, then you have the ability and the responsibility to help foster inclusivity in every environment in which you belong. And that requires a great dose of intentionality. So my job is to help people to become more intentional about being inclusionist in all of their efforts. Now, do you use any, um, so let's say one or two like best practices. So if you're saying be intentional, what are one or two things that you can do to help that intent? Well, I think the first is to practice mindfulness. So uh, my book, which is titled The Intentional Inclusionist, I have a whole chapter that's dedicated to mindfulness and how mindfulness is really critical in allowing people greater propensity to help disrupt unconscious bias and to help foster inclusivity. If we are mindful, that means that we are self-aware. And if we can manage and lead ourselves, then we can manage and lead others into the space of greater inclusivity. And so if we're not observant and we walk into an environment and we're not paying attention, then it precludes us from being able to really take advantage of how can we now change the outcome if um, it's compromising inclusion. And so mindfulness is, is one great strategy that I talk about quite often. And the second one is we need to stop as a society um, seeing political correctness as the appropriate way to be in any type of environment. We need to strive for cultural competence, not political correctness. And so I think that those are two great strategies that people can um, implement into their leadership capacity in order to be more intentional about their inclusion efforts. Now, do you talk about um, the political correctness versus cultural competency in your book as well too? I do. I, there's not a specific chapter that's dedicated to that, but certainly sentiments of that concept is, is threaded throughout the book. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So um, there was another moment where you mentioned guilt is the glue that holds prejudice in place. Yes. I uh, knock your socks off kind of quote. Um, <laughs> what do you mean by that? So I find that a lot of diversity and inclusion practitioners, and this is a blind spot, even for those that are really sensitized to this space and they have passion for this work. But I find that sometimes that passion will lead DNI practitioners to guilt or shame people into doing the work of diversity and inclusion. And I believe that's counterproductive. I want people to do the work of diversity and inclusion because they're well educated about the benefits of it, to where they're doing it because of and not in spite of. And so I feel as though if we're guilting and shaming people and forcing their hands to do the work of diversity and inclusion, then it creates this sense of bitterness or resentment. And I don't think that the actions are going to align in a way that's very authentic and sustainable. And so I think that we need to take a step back as DNI practitioners and um, not allow that guilt to hold that prejudice in place, but rather to educate and create the business case and the value whereby people are just drawn towards the work of diversity and inclusion because they see it as part of their leadership competency, because they see it for the opportunity that it provides and not the obligation, which is a way that a lot of people look at it. Do you and I will, I, will, I will be honest in sharing that most often those who feel guilty or shamed are the individuals that are part of the white population, the Caucasian population. And um, we need to have those individuals to also be a part of the conversation, be a part of the solution towards inclusivity. And so that makes it even more important for us to adopt that mindset that guilt is the glue that holds prejudice in place. So, so it, it also seems too that, that even if a company is just now creating their diversity and inclusion team and strategy and mission, that, that there's so much that comes with it that people are already assuming this is what it's going to be before they ever even roll out their ideas or concepts to, you know, to that, that won't even include guilt, it includes the education. How do you deal with that, that other stuff, the history, and you know, how do you frame it up in a way that, that people don't just start running before they even see you coming? Or as <laughs> so I am a big fan of finding strategic ways to re-engage people around this work. And um, one of the things that I said that day as I presented um, the session that you attended and that I always like to share when I'm, I'm given an opportunity to have audience with people is that if it were up to me, I would completely eradicate the words diversity and inclusion. 
Oh. And it's because I feel like those words have lost its power. And it's unfortunate because um, it causes people to somewhat shy away from the conversation because it's that notion of, well, here we go again, the same thing that I've heard over and over again. And I'm all about being creative and innovative and finding a way to get people to really engage in this work. And so if it means let's reimagine it and talk about it differently just to be able to broach the conversation, then once we have people's attention, we can call it whatever we want to. Um, so the way I like to talk about it is effective management and valuing of human difference. And when you talk about human difference, it really opens up people's psyche because then they can see it for really the broad scope of what diversity is. It is simply a point of respect in which things differ. It's not about the optics of age, race, and gender. And so if we really talk about it in that regard, it helps people to see that there's so many layers of diversity. And I think that that in and of itself resonates with people more so than just talking about it as a standpoint of diversity and inclusion. Now, I always have to put the caveat out there that the way in which we currently know this work is by the way it's labeled and it's talked about. So even though I say if it were up to me, I would eradicate it, I certainly have a great level of appreciation for the terminology and the distinct differences that both of those words carry. And it's part of how we get people to even understand the larger, um, broader umbrella of really what this work is and what it's about. And so I always want to add that for clarity's sake because I think that it's critically important to not um, send the message that those who are being true to, to that terminology are um, not being effective necessarily. I just find that for me personally, if that is a sticking point, then sometimes I may reimagine it and frame the conversation differently just to get the dialogue going. And, and I also remember too that you did spend um, a lot of time weaving in human difference throughout your yeah. presentation as well to human yeah. difference. That was, a, that was a great thing. Okay, so um, you stated it's hard for any person to show up as their best, to show up as their best at any organization if they're always questioning whether or not they belong. Yeah. I, I know there are probably going to be people who are going to hear that and say, I get that, you know, that feels like what I experienced. Can you unpack that a little bit and, and talk about maybe some solutions if, if that job seekers listening to it versus the employer listening to it? Sure, I would love to. Um, I don't think that I've ever gotten into um, a situation where when I had the mic, I did not share that statement because I feel like it's so impactful. Um, but it, it is so true. This sense of belongingness has found its way into the conversations of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, quite frequently over the past you know, several months. And it's because people have come to recognize that the actionable part of inclusion means that we have to be intentional about creating safe spaces for people to really feel as though in their authentic identities, they can be their full selves. And um, doing so should create a sense of belongingness for those individuals into whatever environment they're part of. And so the bottom line is that whether we're talking about um, age, race, gender, I mean, et cetera, all these different layers of diversity and inclusion, the bottom line is that if somebody's in an environment and they do not feel like they belong, it is going to be hard for them to show up at their best, to perform at a high level. And I think that that conversation is important because if people start to realize how much we rely on our peers um, to show up for us every single day, for our teammates to show up for us every single day at a high level, then I think it gives us greater propensity to, to tap into our own personal accountability and responsibility for becoming that intentional inclusionist. And again, part of my platform around this work is to help bring people to see the level of ownership they should have. So we have to answer the question sometimes, what's in it for me? Well, what's in it for you is that you're creating an environment where the people that you count on can be their best simply because you are doing what you can within your sphere of influence to create inclusivity. And so there's multiple ways in which people can do that. First of all, it's all about the culture and the environment. You know, we have to make sure that we are, again, being very observant and we're being mindful. And if individuals are not feeling as though they can um, bring their authentic self to the environment, we need to foster a sense of purity around that level of uniqueness by demonstrating how value that uniqueness and those very um, specific identities, how they can add tremendous value to an organization. It is statistically proven by research that organizations that have heterogeneous teams 
um, or more innovative. They have greater problem solving ability um, and greater creativity. And so that healthy banter and conflict, it leads to solutions that allow companies to attract great talent and ultimately benefiting the bottom line. And so belongingness is huge to this work. Okay, okay, and, and I like the way that you phrased that as well too. You also talked about um, assuming positive intent. Mm -hmm. So it, in that one, it was, um, it was definitely an eye opener because it even made me think about myself and, yeah. and if someone does something at work, is my first assumption positive intent or yeah. negative intent? So here are yeah. two questions for you. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about what you were meaning by assuming positive intent? And then what if you really think? <laughs> sure. You really think that, that Honest question. It wasn't positive intent. So I'll just let you yes. know. So, well, so let me unpack positive intent a little bit, um, specifically as it relates to this whole notion of becoming more inclusion minded. Mm -hmm. So I talk about positive intent because one of the things that I recognize in this space of diversity and inclusion is that the actions and behaviors of, of people are not always with ill intent. And we have to recognize that. Um, there is a, a huge percentage of just pure ignorance. And I use that word um, with the true sense of its definition. Um, around people's thoughts and notions about cultural competence in general and just about diversity and inclusion in general. So we can't assume that people are fully aware of their actions and the implications of it. And so that's why I always talk about the significance of um, educating individuals and becoming culturally competent. The bottom line is that people don't know what they don't know. And when you don't know that you are offending someone or some of your actions and behaviors are landing negatively on someone, then you're not going to be at a place to where you can really shift your behaviors and your attitudes unless people are willing to have dialogue with you and to show you you, if you will. And so when I say assume positive intent, um, what I mean is that even if we sense that there's some type of um, negative um, intent behind someone's comments or someone's actions, the best way to deal with that is to have productive dialogue. Mm -hmm. If we take offense to it and we meet aggression with aggression, then the conversation ends, which means there's no room for dialogue, which means there's no opportunity for understanding and empathy and for people to really put themselves in a vulnerable position to just dialogue about how does that make me feel? What does that mean for a person of my identity? And, and I think those conversations are really important. So I think that we have to first and foremost assume positive intent in order to have productive dialogue. So your next question, which is a, a fair one, and it's, it's, it's a hard one because we are, we are people with feelings and we become very emotionally charged when we sense that part of our identities are being questioned or are being devalued. And so, um, part of what I always tell people is that if you really are after the intent of gaining understanding, we have to be willing to quiet our egos. As hard mm -hmm. as that is, we have to quiet our egos for the sake of the main outcome that we're seeking. And so to do that, we have to be willing to kind of be in a vulnerable state. Now, I think there's a very respectful way to address, you know, comments and um, inappropriate behavior. And quite honestly, it's part of our responsibility as intentional inclusionists to do so. But um, we have to do it in a way that keeps the dialogue going. So if you find that you are starting to input meanings into someone's actions, then the simple answer, which is not easy to do, is to quiet your ego and to maybe ask the question, tell me more, why do you feel that way? I want to understand. And I think that positions a person to um, become less defensive and more willing to engage with you. And I think that there's power in the narrative. People have reasons that they feel and that they think the way they do. And if you give them the opportunity to start talking about it, they'll share. And then I think that that gives us greater ability to um, understand their situation, not so much to agree with it, but to be able to engage again in that healthy dialogue. Okay. All right. <laughs> No, and that was deep. So you put your ego to the side. Now, yeah. now let's say, okay, let's say I'm sitting at a meeting, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about me. I am now an intentional inclusionist. Yes. I'm sitting at a meeting, and in this meeting, someone says something. Engaging in dialogue, um, at, at what point 
is it necessary or is it my responsibility to, to engage in that dialogue during the meeting? Do I need to address it on the spot? Yes. Or? So, so my answer is not yes. I'm saying yes. I understand your question. And, um, and, and to be quite frank, it, this is a it depends type of situation, you know, because what you have to consider is that everything is circumstantial. You know, you could be in a situation to where if you have a lot of people that are on looking and you are in a leadership position and people are, you know, modeling your behavior. Um, then sometimes silence sends a message as well, and that could be dangerous, especially if it's something that is really detrimental to um, negatively impacting an inclusive culture. And so in some regards, I would say you have to kind of count the cost and recognize, is this one of those scenarios to where if I don't say something and say something immediately in this moment, could that also diminish my ability to be seen as an inclusive-minded leader? Mm -hmm. But then there's also those situations to where it may be I feel like I can get better outcomes if I were to address this person one on one because I know that their intent was not negative, it was positive, and they're just unaware of their actions. And then that would be a one on one conversation. Now, um, you know, I think that part of becoming culturally competent is learning, having better ability to, to discern when is this an opportunity where I need to speak up now or I need to speak up later and how do I do that? And it's all circumstantial because it depends on the, on, on the issue. Um, I have had people that um, have been witness to unconscious bias occurring and because those individuals really felt a sense of loyalty to um, the, the message of leadership commitment to inclusion in that environment, they felt that they had to address it. Mm -hmm. And then I've also had situations where individuals have um, come back to acknowledge to those who were in the room that I'm going to address this, just want you to be aware. Um, but I felt that it was more appropriate for me to do that one-on-one -on -one as a coaching opportunity. And so it, it's all about your leadership style. But I think that at the end of the day, there is certainly a responsibility um, if you're a witness to it, to not just be silent, find some way to address it, whether or not it's appropriate to do it immediately or at a different time is really going to be contingent upon the situation and the people that are involved. And I think it's really important for, um, for anyone who listens to this to, to hear the message that it's your responsibility. Yeah. It holds a very different weight from saying, it yeah, you should, or you should consider it. No, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. Again, yeah. you are a keeper of the culture. I think that a lot of times people sense that, you know, the culture is really only up to a certain handful of individuals within that organization. But the culture is comprised of the people in the organization. So regardless of your level, your title, your department, your role, you have a responsibility to help make sure that culture is healthy. And so, and, that, and that's why I always like to talk about this whole notion of being intentional because you cannot operate as an intentional inclusionist by being passive. You have to really, and it has a certain look about it. It's very calculated, calibrated, strategic. It has forethought. You're practicing mindfulness. And all of that collectively is what, you know, yields ends results where people see it as now this is a benefit. This is an opportunity for me to engage in this work. Another quotable moment that I cannot let go by, it's keeper of the culture. <laughs> yes. Keeper of the culture. That is, I love that. Yes, yes. And as an employee, every employee is a keeper of the culture. Absolutely. So yeah. lots of companies talk about, I mean, not just talk about, but they build their brand around saying we welcome diversity. Yeah. And um, and you have a different perspective on that. Um, on so, how how are companies going wrong when they say we welcome diversity? Well, so again, I think they're well intended. I, I do want to say that I think that's important. But I feel as though there are a number of organizations who have not truly taken the time to unpack what is diversity, what is inclusion, and how to successfully deliver upon it. Because the bottom line, as I mentioned before, diversity is not just about optics, age, race, and gender. There's many layers to diversity, and it's simply a point of respect in which things differ. So if we consider that the essence of that definition, then we don't have to do anything to welcome diversity. It's already here. It's already happening. Where we do have to put um, a huge amount of effort into is being intentional to help foster inclusivity. And that's where the action comes from. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost similar to when someone says, 
I don't see color. I don't see race. I just see the human race. Again, <laughs> I know what they mean. And I can appreciate the heart in which they're probably really trying to communicate that. But it's quite disingenuous because the, the, the notion here is to not to move to a place where we get people to not notice difference. We want them to notice difference but to notice difference for the opportunity to be able to leverage and harness those differences for better outcomes. So if you don't notice race and gender, then you, you can't really facilitate, how can I use this to my advantage to see this as an opportunity? And so that's the conversation that I always like to have with organizations when they are talking about their commitment to diversity and inclusion. Just be educated about how in which we're using those terms. Do you see a, um, a connection between leveraging difference and um, and not going uh, um, overboard with making someone feel like a token? Yes, you cannot deny people of their individuality. So I always share that. So one of the things I talk about is we have to attack the optics. Um, so this goes back to your previous question about when companies um, will express why well, embrace diversity and and things of that nature. Um, it's not all about the optics, but I always share that you do have to attack the optics. And what I mean by that is it is hard for any organization that goes to market touting their leadership in the space of diversity and inclusion if people cannot optically see that they are delivering upon that in a significant way. So I'll give you an example. If the organization has a stated commitment to diversity and inclusion, they have all of these policies and procedures, and um, they even claim to have um, other types of, I guess, engagement opportunities to really help foster inclusivity. But if I go to your website or I visit your, your, your establishment and I don't see workforce diversity, it's pretty homogenous, and I, I go to your website and I look at your board of directors and I don't see a person of color or I see maybe only one or two women out of maybe 50 people, which by the way, that happens quite often, then it's going to be hard for people to really see you as a credible source at co being committed to that work. Because at some point in time, people are going to question, if you are committed to it, shouldn't we see the results being reflective of more of the diverse constituents that are in the communities that you're servicing? And so that's where I feel like people have to be really careful. Now, your question about tokenism. One of the things that I say to people all the time, and this is a little bit um, contrary to the belief of many, is I say that if you are tapped to serve in some type of opportunity and you are um, a person of color or part of underrepresented population or identity or demographic, I always tell them to embrace it. And the reason why is because I clearly recognize that not everybody is wired to be a trailblazer to where I can be the only one that's part of that identity and in that environment and thrive. But for those who feel like they can, then I see it as an opportunity. Get in there add value, show them what you're made of, and then make it your responsibility to bring others along that look like you or are also a part of other underrepresented populations. Mm -hmm. So we have to see it as the opportunity that it creates and not so much as, um, is this an indictment on me because I'm the one and only, you know? And the reason that's important is because research states that in order for that minority population on a board in your C-suite level positions to really have voice and influence, there has to be at least a minimum of three. And so I really love telling groups of women because sometimes, and I, and I say this with the utmost respect and love for all women, but sometimes we can be our own demise because we feel like the pathway to success is so narrow that we don't help our sisters along the way to be successful. But we have to lift as we climb. And we have to make sure that we are bringing other women along and we're helping them to also propel themselves to the next level. So if you're the only one in that boardroom and you're feeling like, yes, I've made it, I always tell women, then by research, your voice is really not carrying much influence. So we have to lift as we climb. Yes. I like that. So, um, and I know that you touched on this a second ago, but I have to ask this question just in case, you know, people have this specific question. Sure. What if I'm a job seeker? And I want to know before I take this job, um, what level of their environment, how deeply is inclusion embedded in their culture? Sure. What would you tell them to think about before taking that offer? You know, the uh, potential employee or the organization in terms of extending it? The potential employee, the, the, um, person, the person that's looking yes. at this interviewing and, and now they have the job offer and yes. they're thinking, okay, what do I do? Okay, so I love this question and I think it presents such a huge opportunity um, to be able to amplify the significance that the potential employer has 
in determining where they land or what type of culture and environment that they land in. So while you're doing your homework, um, the saying is true. The organization is interviewing the employee, but the employee should also be interviewing the organization. And if you know that inclusivity is something that's incredibly important for you and for your ability to be able to feel that you can thrive in that environment and have opportunities for success and have a sense of belongingness, then I think that it's within your right and your responsibility to ask questions about what are your policies around diversity and inclusion? What are your initiatives in place and your processes to help ensure that you're fostering inclusivity? And to, to probe and to delve deep into that discussion with the, with the um, potential um, employer. And, and I think that if the answers are not satisfactory to where you feel that you have a comfort level knowing that you can excel in that environment, then you have a decision to make. And I am finding that more and more, particularly the, the younger generations, the millennials and even Generation Z, they are really concerned about inclusive environments. I mean, diversity is like one of the questions that they're talking about out of the gate, you know, and they're so serious about it. And I love that. And I think that part of that is driving and forcing organizations to think more intently about this work. And so part of the opportunity here is not only to impress upon those um, future employees to be careful to do their homework and ask those questions of their future employer, but also for employers to make sure that they are positioning themselves to be an attractive uh, employer of choice, because the war on talent right now is huge. We're all are, uh, you know, I talk with a lot of organizations all the time, and what keeps them up at night is workforce or lack thereof. And so knowing that there is such a huge demand for people to serve in in different roles and organizations, you're competing for talent and you want to do all that you can to position yourself as an organization that's very progressive, very inclusive, very open-minded, and a culture that is bound. Okay, okay. So the last, I had a list of things that were quotable moments, but I can only really mention one more that really knocked my socks off too. And you said, what looks like resistance is sometimes just a lack of clarity. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So I, I like to share that statement, um, specifically when I'm talking about how do we unpack this work of diversity and inclusion in a way that leads people to want to engage. And oftentimes the reason that people don't engage or they, they you sense some level of resistance from them, it's not necessarily because they are against diversity and inclusion, it's because they're just not clear what to think, how to think, how to engage. And so we have to be willing to meet people where they are. Um, and, I, and I think sometimes we make assumptions that people already have some level of understanding about what it is and what it's not. And we, I think that's a dangerous assumption to make. And so if we sense that there's you know, a lack of um, engagement, um, then I would really amp up the opportunity to educate and to see if that creates greater opportunity for engagement. Most often for me, I find that it does. You know, we have to help people to navigate um, the waters, if you will, because this is complex work. And I think that we need to be true to ourselves as DNI practitioners to not feel as though this is something that, pe that everyone should just get very easily and start accepting very easily. And so education is, is a big part of creating that level of clarity. Wow, this has been a really, really, really good conversation. And I know, I can almost guarantee that there are going to be a lot of people who are going to have some additional questions for you. So uh, where can people find you? And what are you up to over there, Nika? What do you have on <laughs> What am I up to this day? Well, first, I'll start by answering how can people connect with me. So I do have a website. It's just simply NikaWhite.com. And the spelling of my first name is N-I-K-A, white, just like the color. And on my website, it also has all of my social media platforms where I encourage anyone to engage with me. I do have a number of resources on my website that many people find uh, very helpful. I have white papers where I have done a lot of research on different topics. Of course, um, people can purchase my book by going to my website, The Intentional Inclusionist. I'm also really excited to share that September, so later this week, um, book number two will be released, and it's called oh, yeah. Next Level Inclusionist. Yes, it's all about I think I am the Next Level Inclusionist, and okay. it's all about transforming yourself and your work for greater diversity, equity, and inclusion success. And so, you know, the first book was about appealing to the individual at the personal level. How can you start making this part of your leadership competency? Now I'm really digging deeper, and I'm I'm communicating very um key strategies that helps people to elevate the work of inclusion so i'm really excited about that and so people will be able to soon get that from amazon and, and other places but yeah so 
um, my website is a great place to connect with me, nicowhite.com again. And in terms of what I'm up to, um, I have such a passion for this work. And so I feel incredibly blessed to be in a space where I feel a sense of purpose and um, being able to help organizations to have greater impact that really is life changing for a lot of individuals and for organizations. And so this work, while it's um, something that I am able to collect a paycheck from, at the end of the day, I really feel like I am, I am where I need to be. And so um, I continue to travel all over the country and even some international markets. Um, consulting and speaking and training. Um, I do have a virtual training platform that I just launched about a month ago. So folks can go to my website and to take advantage of that. Um, but my goal is to continue to strive to help grow people as intentional inclusionists every single day, one person at a time. So what I'm and I can so tell that you have a passion for it. And um, I love, and this is, I love that you have such a unique way of bringing everyone into this conversation. And so a conversation that has historically made some populations feel excluded from it, yeah. you're bringing everyone in it and you have a lot of heart for it. So um, for those who haven't heard your presentation before, I think that, um, that it would do them a lot of justice to be able to hear one of your presentations about the intentional inclusionist. So, I am going to wrap this up with you the same way that I wrap this up with um, each of our other guests and flash questions. Three flash questions. Tell me the first thing that comes to mind, okay? All righty. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, so the first one is, it's never too late to... Travel the world. I love it, love it, love it. Okay, okay. Travel the world. The second question is, I get inspired by... Authentic people. Okay. Yeah, authentic people. And the third question is, career success means? How I personally define it, as to, e to each his own, how I personally define it. Yeah, success yeah. for each person looks different. <laughs> I like that. So all of your details, we'll make sure that we put it um, in our details section um, for this <laughs> podcast. But Nika, thank you so much for being on the show, for talking sure. about and for answering all of my questions. I appreciate you. No, I appreciate you as well. Thanks so much for having me. And it was great to reconnect. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Be sure to tune in next week because we have so much more in store for you. Until next time, keep going, keep growing, and keep glowing.